A team from the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAE, has now arrived at the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. This after a three-hour delay, and we should know in the middle of ongoing shelling at Europe's largest nuclear facility. Our Melissa Bell is in Kyiv, Ukraine. Melissa, the, the director of the IAEA admitted this, this is a mission that is, in his words, quote, not risk-free, but one that has to happen. What do we know about what the inspectors will be doing there over the coming days? Well, in the end, Poppy uh, and Jim, it was even more fraught than they'd anticipated since what we saw around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant as Rafael Grossi and his team were setting out was some of the worst shelling uh, this Russian-held town has seen, says its mayor, since the occupation began in March. Uh, with all of the dangers to the plant, as you mentioned, one of those reactors has now been turned off. It is a single reactor that is now functioning at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. And that is the context, Poppy, in which uh, they set off this morning, uh, very bravely uh, saying that they would carry on and get there nonetheless. It took them uh, much longer than it should have, as Jim just mentioned, three hours. They were stuck with the Ukrainian energy minister making it plain that once they crossed that Ukrainian line, once they crossed the front line into Russian-held territory, and that's where the power plant lies, uh, Ukrainians couldn't be responsible for their safety. It gives you an idea of the risks they've taken. The question is, of course, as you say, what they will see, what they will find. The very fact that they are there, good news, uh, but it is unclear exactly what they're going to have access to. We've been hearing from Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, saying uh, that the Russian side would make sure they were had access to everything they needed to see, uh, that they would be showing what the Russians say are damage that has been caused to the buildings uh, by Ukrainian uh, shelling. Uh, but the very fact uh, that they are there, clearly, despite the renewed shelling uh, this morning, the killed three people in the local town, that's how violent it got before they arrived, uh, is good news. Uh, what the plan is at this stage is that Rafael Grossi himself will head back across the line to Zaporizhia city, back on the Ukrainian-held side, by this evening, leaving several of his team behind. That's, again, according to Ukraine's energy minister. So we should hear more from him about exactly what they've been able to see about just how safe this plant now is, Jim and Poppy. Yeah. Goodness, when you look at those wide shots and see those multiple reactors, you just get a sense of the scale of the danger here. Melissa Bell and Keith, thanks so much. Joining now is the former NATO Allied Supreme Commander, General Wesley Clark. Uh, General Clark, always good to have you on. First, I, I, I want to get your sense right now of the ongoing danger to the plant now that IAEA inspectors, at least, have been allowed to go there. Well, I think there is always danger to the plan. Something like this is in the middle of a conflict zone. Yeah. But, uh, Jim, um, this is also the way that the Russians have manipulated the situation. Mm -hmm. Think of this in medieval terms as a fortress. You can put your forces in it, and it's unassailable. So the Ukrainians can't afford to shoot at it because they'll destroy it. Mm -hmm. Putin's forces use it as a base. And so yeah. uh, it's not only good militarily, but it's also good to uh, distract public attention. So while we're yep. focused on this, the Russian filtration camps continue, war crimes continue, and, uh, and we're watching this, all manufactured by Russia. Yeah, it's a smart point there. Uh, it, I do want to ask you, because uh, th this week we've seen the first steps in a significant Ukrainian counteroffensive in the south focused on Kherson. Do Ukrainian forces today have the capabilities and the weapons they need to take and hold territory currently held by Russian forces? Well, certainly not. But they do mm -hmm. have the capability, if they use it correctly, to move deeply into at least Kherson. Um, if they've mm -hmm. succeeded in cutting off Russian reinforcements and resupply across the Dnieper River, that's a big step. And then uh, if the Russian command and control is attacked, that's another big step. And they've got artillery. They are using it. This is a reconnaissance-led attack that's going to move slowly. It's going to grind its way through. They're going to conserve their forces. But to really clean the Russians out, they need armored fighting vehicles, more artillery. They need mm -hmm. air fighter bombers and long-range uh, ATACMS missiles. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're a long way from having everything they need. But this is a very, very important attack strategically and politically mm -hmm. for Ukraine. Uh, we, we've been learning through CNN reporting that Ukraine and the U.S. war-gamed this counteroffensive out to some degree in advance of this, uh, and it appears that the U.S. 
counseled Ukraine away from a more expansive counteroffensive, uh, seemed to direct them to focus their fire and resources on Kherson. Was that the right call in your view? Well, absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. it, look, it's, it's like the old story about the invasion of France in D-Day. You know, France has several thousand miles of coastline. It could be invaded anywhere, but you have to invade it somewhere. And mm -hmm. so of this 1,500 kilometers of front, you have to concentrate forces and firepower in order to be successful. Uh, there were a lot of different mm -hmm. uh, pulls and shoves on where to go, but yes, you have to concentrate to be effective, and that's what the Ukrainians are doing. Let's look for a moment at the Russian side before we go. Uh, Putin did add some 100,000 forces to the military to back up, particularly after the tremendous losses Russian forces have had. He has not, though, called for a general mobilization or a draft. Does that indicate to you, as it does to some, that he fears he does not have the broad public support at home for an expanded conflict? Well, it may indicate that, but it also indicates that he's counting on, on, on Father Winter to win the war for him. Once mm -hmm. he cuts off the gas supplies in Europe and he pushes on the political structures in Germany and Italy and maybe France and people get uh, shaky on this, they reduce it. Uh, he's, uh, he's calculating a long-term game and uh, trying to minimize disruption on the Russian uh, Euro Eurocentric mm -hmm. population. So it's a strategic it's a strategic decision by Putin. He mm. thinks that's the way to do it. It yep. might work uh, if we don't continue to give our full support to Ukraine. We will see. We will watch. Uh, General Wesley Clark, always good to have you on. Thank you. This just into CNN. The chairman of Luke Oil, that is Russia's second largest oil producer, has died after falling out of a sixth floor window at a hospital near Moscow. That's what Russian state media is reporting this morning. In a statement, Luke Oil confirmed Ravel Maganov's death did not mention the cause being that fatal fall, saying instead the executive died following a severe illness. In March, shortly after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Luke Oil called for, quote, the soonest termination of the war. We should note this. CNN has found at least five prominent Russian businessmen have died reportedly by suicide since late January. And we also historically have seen cases of dissidents, journalists, it's other, uh, others dying and the cause being cited as falling off balconies or out of windows. We'll continue to follow that story.